Thank y'all. Um, my name is Aaron Thomas. If you don't, don't know who I am, I'm the youth pastor here. Um, normally, I make announcements, and one of my favorite things about preaching is that I don't have to. Uh, and so, a few weeks ago, it was my birthday, and Pastor Mike made everybody here sing happy birthday to me, and I loathe that. Uh, I appreciate the love, but I don't like it. Like, I don't like that attention. And so there's a little part of me, the sick part of me, that's satisfied to watch Mike get up here and make announcements every Sunday morning because I know that he hates it. Like, I want... <laughs> I, I want to get him back for what he did to me. We all want justice. Like, we have that feeling, you know, like someone hurt me or they wronged me and I want them to be hurt or I want them to be wronged. Uh, I want them to be judged because of the bad things they've done. In our house... That looks like our kids running to us and being like, eh, they hit me. And then when we start talking to them, we come to find out the one who's doing the telling hit them first. You know, like they want justice for being hit, but they don't want justice for being the one who hit. Um, and that, that looks different in adults, but the heart is the same. Where like when someone pulls out in front of you in traffic and you immediately see red and maybe say things under your breath that you shouldn't and you're like... There's, there is nothing, no possible reason that person should have done this. But then when you pull out in front of somebody, you're like, sorry. <laughs> or you're like, Ugh, they just need to understand the hurry I'm in. Like, uh, there was no other break. When else was I going to go? Like, we justify our own wrong behavior, and we want other people to be squashed for theirs. Uh, and never mind that when we're late, it's usually because of our own poor decisions, because we, like, snooze the alarm too many times and then tried to make a hot breakfast before shoving all your kids in the car. Um, that's not personal experience at all there. Uh, but like somebody talks about you behind your back and you find out about it and you're so mad that you talk about them behind their back. You, you, we just, we, we trade it back and forth. It's not wrong for us to desire justice, uh, to want God's judgment to come down on wickedness. That is not wrong. What is wrong is when we fail to realize that we're also in need of judgment. And so we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject this morning. Judgment. Yay. Glad you came. Uh, we're in the book of Jonah again. Uh, and Jonah is supposed to be a mirror for us. As we see Jonah struggle with his God-given responsibility to preach God's word to a wicked nation, we should also see our own struggle with our God-given responsibility to make disciples of all nations. And in, in chapter 3, in this particular part of the mirror we're looking at today, hopefully, by God's Spirit, we'll see our own need to repent before a holy God this morning. And we want to remember, when we're talking about repentance, it's helpful to, to define repentance because different uh, versions of it and different ideas swirl around. Um, repentance is about turning to God. Uh, the Hebrew word means to change direction. Uh, but the, the way Pastor Mike often explains it to us is that it's a change of mind. And when I'm talking to students about it, I often say we're changing our mind about our sin to see it as disgusting, to see it really as not something that's pleasurable and desirable for us to indulge in, but something for us to reject because it's rebellion against the God who made us. So we turn from that and turn our attention to God and say, you are worthy, you are beautiful, you are desirable. I don't want that. I want you. And that's what we want to think of repentance being. Um, it's our aim as a church, as Pastor Mike shared with us last week, our, our aim as a church, our mission in gathering is to grow together in knowledge, love, and obedience to God for his glory. And we're glad that you're here this morning, that you've come this morning to grow with us today. But that means that we gathered here not just to listen to somebody talk. If you just came to listen to somebody talk, you could have done that from home. There's a thing called YouTube. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but there are better preachers than I speaking on YouTube all the time. Like if you just came to hear somebody talk, you're, you're missing it. Um, we gathered here together to be changed together, to be made more into the image of Jesus, to be made more into the image of our King and our Savior so that we can be faithful to live the way that God originally created us to live. So that when we'll leave this place, we'll go to make disciples in our homes and neighborhoods and schools and workplaces. And if we're honest with ourselves... We'll admit that we're not fully committed to that, not, not completely. And we have things that we need to repent of today. 
And we're going to be in Jonah chapter 3. So uh, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter 3. As you're turning there, I'm going to try to catch you up if you weren't here the, the couple of weeks we spent in Jonah 1 and 2. Because uh, we're, we're going to pick up in the middle of this story. Uh, and this is not just a kid's story. It's, it's often told in children's church, and it's a fun story to tell. But there's so much more happening here. And God's people, Israel, were being oppressed by a nation who had committed tons of wickedness. And they were the Assyrians. And their capital city was Nineveh. Uh, so Nineveh was like the core or the embodiment of evil in this, in this nation. The, the same evil that had been running through the hearts of man since Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God and left the garden. And since God knows everything, he was aware of the wickedness of the Ninevites. So he calls a prophet from among his people, from, from among Israel, to go and preach against that nation. And in chapter 1, Jonah is called. He's that prophet. But at least at first, he doesn't go. He, he, God tells him to get up and go. And instead, he gets up and runs away. Um, and we see God's faithfulness to the nations as he poured out his compassion on this group of non-believing sailors who just happened to be called up in Jonah's rebellion. And God was still faithful to save them, even as Jonah was running away. And at the end of that chapter, when Jonah's thrown into the sea and is sinking to what should be his death, those sailors, those non-believing sailors from another nation, are praising the one true God as they sail away on calm seas. And we saw that God's compassion is for everyone, both the insider and the outsider. And then Jonah's swallowed by that great fish, and then chapter 2 is his conversation with God in the belly of that fish. Um, he, rather than dying, he finds that God's mercy meets him in the depths. And he expresses his gratitude and his devotion to God in the fish belly. And then he declares at the end of chapter 2 that salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. And at the end of that chapter, my favorite part is that God makes a fish barf him up onto the... Oh, it's Sorry, vomit. He vomits him. Uh, that's the better way to say that? Anyway, uh, so Jonah is vomited onto the shore, and that's where we left him uh, two weeks ago, covered in bile and fish guts and sand. So now, hopefully you've made it to Jonah chapter 3, and we're going to read that together. So let's read God, God's word. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In forty days, Nineveh will be demolished. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh. In Nineveh, by order of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock, is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth, and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. God saw their actions that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. All right, we're gonna start at the beginning again. I, I know we just read it. Let's go back through it now, uh, slowly this time. Uh, we're gonna look at Jonah's second chance. In, in the first three verses of Jonah chapter three, parallel the first three verses of Jonah chapter one. Uh, the author of Jonah does this, this masterful job telling this story. Uh, often, at least me, I know when I was reading the Old Testament, especially when I was younger, I would think of it as like a, a primitive book. It was, it was not polished. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't the kind of stories we tell today. But this is a, some of it's lost. A lot of it is lost in the translation from Hebrew to English. We miss some of the poetry. We miss some of the beauty. We miss some of the connections. But this is a well-crafted piece of literature. So by repeating these words, the author of Jonah is making us make the connection between chapter 3 and chapter 1. So in chapter 1, God says to Jonah, get up, go to Nineveh. But if you remember, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish, away from the Lord's presence. And then now, uh, let's look at verse 2, where God says, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. 
And Jonah is unique among the prophetic books because other prophets are, are told the message. When the word of the Lord comes to them, it'll say the word of the Lord came to so-and-so and this is what that word was. But to Jonah, it's the word of the Lord came to him and he's told to go and eventually he'll be told the message. Because sometimes God's gonna call you to do something and you aren't gonna have all the answers. You're not gonna have all the pieces that you want. You're not gonna have your questions met. Uh, God may tell you to go to your neighbor and talk to them about Jesus. And you think to yourself, well, I don't really know their story. I don't know their church background. I don't know their faith background. I, don't, I also don't know what to say in that moment. I don't know how to segue that conversation. And even though we have those questions, God still wants us to go. He's with us. When Jesus tells us to go make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28, he says that he will be with us to the end of time. He's with us in our going, but what he wants is for us to be obedient to go. Some of us myself included, have grown in knowledge and love of God. Like we gather to worship every week. We, we can spout off Bible verses or doctrines. But then the obedience part is where we need to grow. There are things that we're, we're neglecting or avoiding. We're, there's, there's ways that we're not obeying. And God has told Jonah here again to go. And then we're meant to ask, is he going to do this? Like, will he go? And then thinking about it as a mirror, how many times has God told you to go somewhere? or to go to someone, and will you go? God gives us so many chances to do the right thing. He's not waiting to pounce on us if we hesitate or if we step out of line. He, he's gonna correct us and bring us back. But I, I know for me as a father, one of the things I have to repent of most often, and I wanna be clear that I'm saying one of the things because I have a lot of things that I have to repent of often, but one of them as a father is that I am quick, especially when I'm frustrated or I've had a rough day, I'm quick to bark at my kids, to fuss at them, to, to call them out loudly. And I don't discipline my kids well all the time. I don't always follow through with the discipline the way that I should. But one thing that I hate is how quick I am to just snap at them. And sometimes I'll find myself in my anger. I can hear them in another room about to do something that they know they shouldn't do. And I'm just waiting on it so that I can yell at them. Like that, the sick part of me is like, oh, I'm going to get them now. Like God's not like that. <laughs> Praise God, he's not like that. He doesn't squash Jonah, but he also didn't let Jonah run away. He didn't let Jonah skirt his responsibility. He got his attention and brought him, brought him in line, and he will bring us in line. And the way he got Jonah's attention was pretty rough. Like, I've never been eaten by a fish, but I imagine it's pretty gross. Uh, I have this shirt that someone pied me in the face with a plate full of whipped cream and then all the whipped cream fell into the shirt and I wasn't able to wash it quickly so it smelled like spoiled milk. And it's still, if I hold it up to my nose, I can still smell that and it's been years. So I imagine Jonah's clothes like were burned or put in the trash or something. Like I, fish guts have to be worse than spoiled milk. Um, but in the belly of that fish, Jonah started coming to terms with his own rebellion in chapter two. So let's see how he responds in verse three here. It says that Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. And now Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. So we see that Jonah went. He didn't necessarily want to go, but he knew that he had to go. He knew that he was supposed to go. He went according to the Lord's command. And then just for your information, Nineveh was not a short distance from Jerusalem. It was not a short trip that Jonah was taking. Uh, depending on who you ask, it was at least 500 miles. And 500 miles in a car, we can do that, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. But Jonah's not in a car. This is across land. This is a long trek that he was having to make before he even started to preach the message. There was a, a long trail of obedience in each footstep that carried him closer and closer to Nineveh. The path of obedience is a long one. And it's going to last our entire lifetime. If you're a believer, you're on a daily journey towards Jesus. And that's why after following Jesus for four seconds or for 40 years, we can say as a church that we're about growing together in knowledge and love and obedience to God for his glory. That is a lifelong thing. No, none of us have arrived on that, that journey of obedience. And so in chapter two, in the belly of that fish, Jonah worships God through his, his prayer. There's this poetic prayer recorded. And then today, we have that time of worship through song, and it's wonderful. I love hearing y'all's voices, everyone's voices crying out to God together. It is an integral part of what it means to follow Jesus, is to gather and worship, and to worship him with those types of praises. 
But that's not the entirety of what it means to worship God or the entirety of what it means to follow Jesus. Gathering is good. We should gather here. We should sing praises. But if we aren't leaving these gatherings with an increased love of God and more desire to obey Him in the week ahead, then we're missing the point. Jonah worshiped God in chapter 2, and now we see him putting the rubber on the road. He's now in the slog of obedience. And through his obedience, we're going to see Nineveh's repentance. So let's go to verse 4. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. So verse 3 says that Nineveh is a three-day walk. And the walled portion of the city was massive. Uh, history tells us that the wall was about 100 feet tall, 50 feet wide. This is a massive wall. But at its biggest, the, the center part of the city with its, its massive wall, that wall was only about seven and a half or eight miles in, in circumference, which is still huge, but it wouldn't take you three days to walk around it. So obviously they, they've got to be meaning the more outlying country surrounding Nineveh, the, the villages and the small... Or, the more rural area that spread out. So Jonah had a long way to go in his journey. And in verse four, he sets out on the first day of his walk, proclaiming this weird message. It's short, but it is not sweet. Like Jonah doesn't sound at all like Billy Graham at an evangelistic rally. He sounds more like that guy at the stoplight on the corner with the megaphone yelling things at people that some of you are laughing so you know who I'm talking about um, and that happens all over the place it, 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 they might have the right heart but like the wrong delivery like when we ask our kids I, we use I use our kids a lot as examples I need to start shaming myself instead of them uh, but anyways we use our kids to say hey go tell your brother or sister something and they'll on the spot just turn around and yell it ah! it's like like, technically, they did what we asked, but they didn't really execute in the way we wanted them to. It was, it was more questionable. Um, in Hebrew, Jonah's sermon is five words. For us, it translates to something like, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished or destroyed or overturned. And we'll talk about that more later. Uh, but this sermon is fascinating to me. Uh, I've already gone much longer today than Jonah did. And I have a lot more to say, so sorry. Um, it's unclear if this is exactly what Jonah was told to preach, because we don't hear God told Jonah to say this. We just hear this is the message Jonah preached. And most prophets, when they proclaimed judgment, they would also proclaim the way out of that judgment. There would be instructions on what to do, on how to repent, on who to turn to. There would be a, a conversation about who God is or, or to turn to Yahweh. There would be something, but we don't see that in Jonah. And again, the book of Jonah is full of opposites. We have expectations and they're flipped on their head. It seems to us like this message would be rejected on sight. This dude probably still smelling like fish guts, shouting about coming judgment to a, a city that's known for its evil and violence. At the minimum, you would expect them to be like, get this guy out of here. But they, they don't. Let's look at the way they respond, speaking of opposites, in verse 5. It says, the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. I'm sorry, what? There's no mention of God in Jonah's message, but they believed God. There's no instructions on what to do, but they proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth. We, we would not expect this city to do this, but they do. And this is the first day of Jonah's walk. It said it was, would have taken him three days to walk through or around the city proclaiming this message. On the first day, we see their immediate repentance. They're listening to that crazy message and responding to God. Their hearts are, are ready for this. And fasting is about denying yourself the basic need of food. Fasting in its true form is not eating. So that your growling stomach cries out to God with you. And you were reminded that you need God more than you need to eat. And then sackcloth was this garment that would be put on. It's a scratchy garment that meant to, you would feel the discomfort and be reminded that you need God more than you need basic comforts. But sackcloth was also the clothing of the poor. If you couldn't afford clothes, you would make them out of whatever you could find. So a burlap sack would be readily available and you'd make your clothes out of that. So at putting on sackcloth, if you didn't have to wear that, when you put that on, you're acknowledging your poor condition before a holy God. And that's what, that's what they're doing. The Ninevites, this, this evil nation, these evil people know that they are broken. 
They know that they deserve to be judged for their actions. It's not at all what we expect, but it's what we see. And their repentance doesn't stop there. It continues. So let's pick up in verse 6. It says, When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And then he issued a decree in Nineveh. So the ruler of this city, he, he heard the word reached him. So the word probably didn't come from Jonah. Word came to him because people were spreading that word. And the king, like he's in charge of all of these people. And he hears that his people are proclaiming a fast. And he follows their lead. The king follows the lead of his people, of his subjects. And they've done excavations on the city of Nineveh and on the walls where the names of these kings were inscribed, it would say, so-and-so, king of Assyria, king of the world. And then it would say the next king's name, king of Assyria, king of the world. They, the, the city was so massive, the nation was so massive, they saw themselves as being the center of the world. The, the king was in that position. That's how his people would have understood him. But then we see him humbling himself and following his people. How many kings identify with their people in that way? How many kings follow their lead? How many kings recognize their humble status before God? In this instance, this king, this man is at least kind of acting like the one true king. Jesus, who identified with us by taking on flesh and living among us. Jesus, who in Sunday school last week, we talked about how he was baptized. He had nothing to repent of. He had no sin to, to repent before God, but he was baptized, getting, giving us an example. He was doing what, what we were doing to set an example for us. And then we see throughout the, the scriptures that God humbles himself. Jesus humbled himself before God the Father to the point of dying on the cross what a king. This is the kind of king that it is a joy to follow. The king of Nineveh continues leading his people. Let's pick up again in the middle of verse 7 where it says about the decree. It says, By order of the king and his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock, is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth. And everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. The thought of not being able to drink water made me really thirsty right then. Um, so the king's following his people's example, but then he ups the ante. In his decree, he orders that they not only fast from food, but they also not drink water. You can fast from food. Does anybody know how many days generally you survive with no food? 40. But from water, about three. Th these people would be, would be dead in a number of days. The king is putting everything on the line. And he lumps their animals and livestock in with this repentance, which seems weird to us. And it seemed weird to me. And so I had to consult people who are way smarter than me who study the scriptures and write commentaries. And I'll just tell you what they said. He lumps the animals in. And as the animals get hungry and are crying out, it's, it's an a, a audible reminder of their need for repentance. And without water, these animals would also die in a few days. And animals at that time, livestock, were that was your bank. That was your wealth. That is your economy. And so the king is pulling in the, like, the entirety of the nation into this repentance. He's saying, I don't care if our economy crashes. I don't care if this folds. We're in a desperate situation before God. That, that, that's crazy humility. humility. It is deep repentance. These people, again, recognize their brokenness. And the king says they shouldn't just perform the fast, but they also need to call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. They know why they're in the mess that they're in. They're not trying to blame shift. Like in the garden, when, when God seeks Adam and Eve after they sinned, and he's like, what have you done? And Adam's like, Eve made me do it. And Eve's like, the snake made me do it. Like, we all blame shift. When we pull out in traffic, it's not our fault. It's something else's fault. Like, when we harm one another, we, we blame shift. This is not what's happening in Nineveh. They recognize their need for God to show them mercy and have compassion on them. Even Jonah's repentance 
And if you re- go back and read chapter two, his repentance is not this complete. He does thank God for his mercy and he says he'll look towards God. He says that salvation belonged to the Lord and those things are good and right and true. But in chapter two, Jonah doesn't acknowledge his own wrongdoing. He doesn't acknowledge his rebellion against God. And so in this story, at least for now, the Ninevites, their repentance looks more whole than the prophet of God. Again, we see the the opposites here. And when we remember, again, that this is a mirror, we have to start asking ourselves, how quick, how quick am I to admit my own sinfulness? How quick are we to admit our own sinfulness, especially if you've been following Jesus for years, because we have this tendency to start think, thinking that we've, we've done enough. We're good enough now. We've come far enough. We've grown enough. Like, at least we're not like them, whoever them is to us that we're comparing ourselves to. We've got to start asking ourselves questions like, have you told lies or stretched the truth to make yourself look better this week? Have you viewed anything immoral on your phone or computer or TV this week? Have you done anything unethical? It's tax season. Did you report all those numbers correctly? Have you lashed out in anger at someone, either by telling them off to their face or talking about them behind their back this week? I have. Have you broke the speed limit? My wife has. Just, just for clarity, she told me to say that. <clears throat> but we, we've got to ask ourselves these questions. Have, have you failed to obey the Spirit when He told you to go talk to that person about Jesus? Have you failed to encourage another brother or sister with the word that God wanted you to encourage them with? Y'all, you know, we have much to repent of. We're all deserving of God's judgment. And when we repent, we know who to turn to. Unlike the king of Nineveh, let's look at verse 9. He says, who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. So the king knows he deserves judgment, but he doesn't know God. He doesn't know if their repentance is going to be enough. He doesn't know that compassion is waiting for him. There's one in his midst who does know, who has the answers But he's not telling the whole story. We're going to talk about Jonah chapter 4 next week. And that's where we're going to see more Jonah's motives and why he's acting the way that he's acting. And we'll see that he doesn't want God to have compassion on this people. He thinks that they deserve to be annihilated. They deserve the judgment that God threatens them with. So he doesn't tell them the point of his preaching. Speaking of, the point of my sermon this morning is that we deserve God's judgment, but when we repent, we receive his compassion. I want you to to know and hear the whole story, and we want to make sure we're telling people the whole story as we're sharing this message with others. God is faithful. The Ninevites don't have all the answers. They don't understand the doctrines of justification and sanctification. They don't know that there's one God who made the whole world and that he's called a people to himself, that that, that the Messiah is going to come through. Like They don't know that, the things that Jonah knows, but they're going to experience God's compassion after they've repented. And what I want us to see in that is that God is going to save people whether we help him out or not. God is faithful to save people whether we participate or not. He, is, he didn't give us the Great Commission because he needed us so badly. He's not sitting in heaven begging us to obey and go, please go tell him the message. God gave us the Great Commission so that we could, it's an invitation to participate in the work that he's doing in the world. It's an invitation for your joy, for my joy. And as, as we talk about these things, if you're feeling conviction about not sharing the gospel, I've, I think I've talked about this before. It is easy to stand on a stage on a church on Sunday morning, relatively easy to stand up in front of people and talk about Jesus. Because all of you, you came here this morning, you expected me to talk about Jesus. It is much harder for me to go home and to stand in my driveway and have a conversation with my neighbor about Jesus. Because all he wants to talk about is the weather or his truck or the dogs, or what that crazy neighbor across the street did, or whatever else. That, that's hard. This is easier. So I, I feel, if you're feeling conviction, I'm feeling this conviction too. Um, one of the most common reasons that we give for not telling people about Jesus is that we don't know what to say. 
And I can't remember who first challenged me on that to say, you're just putting too much pressure. You're making it about you. It's not about you. It's not about us. We're not saving anyone. Your argument is not saving anyone. God is saving people. All he needs from us is a willingness to open our mouths and start the conversation. To be willing to wade into how, whatever awkwardness may be coming our way. And if we do that, we'll see p- people experience God's compassion. Let's read verse 10. It says that God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. So I want you to notice what God saw. It wasn't their sackcloth. It wasn't their empty bellies. It wasn't their thirsty cows dressed in sacks, which I don't, I really, when I read stuff like that, I have questions. Like, how do you wrestle a burlap sack onto a cow? Like, how do you keep it on them? Like, if they're pulling it off, are they supposed to go back and re, re-put it on? I, anyway, that's a side note. God didn't see all of that. What it says he saw was their actions He saw that they had turned from their evil ways. If we're truly repentant, then we will act. Actions follow real repentance. Some of us are sinning day in and day out, calling it a struggle, but we aren't struggling. We're rolling over and letting that sin kick our butts because we don't really want to fight it. Maybe we're confessing that sin to God, but not then fighting it, not trying to fight it. The action isn't following the repentance. If you know that you have certain apps on your phone that you are likely to lust when you open up, then delete them. If you know that staying up late watching TV causes your mind to wander into sin, then put the remote down and go to bed. If you know that watching a certain news network causes you to feel rage towards other image bearers of God, then change the channel. If you know that certain restaurants or foods cause you to keep eating past your own need, then avoid them. If you know that your bank account has more of your heart than God does, then start giving your money away. If you know that keeping your home clean matters more to you than being hospitable, then invite someone to dinner and then practice the spiritual discipline of leaving that pile of laundry on the couch so that they can see it when they get there. And I, I, I want to be clear. I'm saying these things to myself as I'm saying them to you. I can't, we can't be the Holy Spirit for one another, but whatever it is that the Spirit is convicting you of, do not ignore it. Repent, see it as disgusting rebellion against the God who made you, and then turn to him, reject your sin, turn to the Lord as the one who knows best how to live, and then live the way that he's calling you to live. When the Ninevites did this, it says that God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. So some translations say that God repented, or it says that God changed his mind, But if you've been around church for a while, you know that God does not change. So we have to ask what's happening here. And what's happening is that God had compassion on them. He threatened disaster, but he had compassion when they repented. And when God threatens disaster on us, when he threatens judgment coming, it's not like when I threaten judgment on my kids, there's a sick part of me that's like, you deserve this punishment. Like when they disobey, God's not like that. If God is threatening judgment, it's because he wants us to turn back to him. His his threat of judgment is always because he wants us to be in relationship with him. That's what he made us for. That's what he desires for us is that we would be in that relationship, that we would know him and be with him. Jonah took the message hoping for disaster. The word in Jonah's sermon that's translated as demolished or destroyed or overthrown, depending on your translation, it can be translated a couple different ways. Obviously, it can mean destruction, which is what Jonah hoped for. And in Genesis chapter 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it talks about how they were overthrown. That same word is used there. The word that destruction or destroyed is used there in Sodom and Gomorrah. But it's also used in Psalm chapter 30, verses 11 and 12. 
And they say, I think we have those on the screen. Um, but Psalm 30, 11 and 12 says, you turned, the word turned is the same word that's translated as destroyed or demolished in Jonah uh, 3. Uh, it says, you turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. And friends, this is God's invitation to us that we would feel the weight of our sin, that you would feel the weight of your rebellion against him and not wallow in it. God doesn't want you to wallow in shame. But then that he wants you to see that you, like all of us, deserve God's judgment so that you will then repent and receive his compassion. Let him turn your brokenheartedness into dancing. Let him take off your sackcloth and put on gladness and then sing with us as we have today. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. If you do this, and this is, it's hard because many of us, not everyone, but you may be here and you're hung up on your own sin. There's something you've committed in your past or something you're struggling with and you feel like you can't move past it. You, can't, you feel like God can't actually forgive you for it. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. If the enemy can't stop you from, from hearing the gospel, from understanding and believing the gospel, then he will try to cripple you from ever really living in the joy that's found there. He, Satan, not God, wants you to feel the shame for your sin. Where he, he wants your sin to identify you, where you think I am this person because I've done these things. And God is not saying that to you. God is inviting you into his presence, into his joy. If, if we don't move past it, then we're missing out on the extravagant love that God wants to shower on us. He really, really wants you to experience his compassion because he loves you so much. Because we've rejected God's rule and authority, we all deserve God's judgment. We can't survive in his presence. We were created to live in his presence, but we can't survive there. We're deserving of judgment. But God is compassionate on us, and he has made a way for us to be brought back into his presence, back into a relationship with him, and it's through his son. And maybe you've heard that so many times that your eyes glaze, glaze over when you hear it. But y'all, praise God that you know that inside and out. Keep preaching it to yourself. Keep believing it. Keep reminding yourself of it. Jesus lived a sinless life in our place, the life that we can't live. He died the death that we deserve. He took God's judgment for us. He took our sin from us. And then he rose from the grave to give us life. And he says that all who come to him will be saved. Repent of your sin and receive his compassion. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Do that today for the first time or do that today for the thousandth time. Repentance is a lifelong thing for the believer. And then share the joy that you found in the Lord with someone this week. We, we get to be with God again. There is a day coming when all of this will be over. When the sickness and the disease, the, the brokenness, the death will be over. Our son is about to turn seven. And this week, we, I, we were driving somewhere and he just said, I can't wait. Or he said, I wish that Adam and Eve hadn't sinned so that there would be no sin in the world. Which opens up a whole other can of worms because if they hadn't sinned, one of us would have. Like we're all rebellious. Anyway, that's a, a side note. But at seven, at seven playing baseball, digging in the dirt, being in first grade, he recognizes that there is something wrong with this place and it's not supposed to be this way. And God is, the brokenness we experience is supposed to remind us of that. Because of God's compassion, those who believe in his son will be with him forever in a coming new heaven and new earth Let's go tell people about it. Let's preach that good news to the world starting in this parking lot, in the restaurants you eat at, in the homes and neighborhoods you'll be in this evening, in the workplaces, in the schools you're heading into tomorrow, and everywhere else that we go. You don't have to preach it perfectly. Jonah sure didn't. Just be obedient to share the message and trust God to do what only he can do.
which is save people. It's not about us anyway. It's about him. Let's pray. Father God, again, we, we love you. God, we thank you for, for Jonah. We thank you for your word. We thank you for reminding us that we are deserving of your judgment, but that if we repent, we'll receive your compassion. God, help us to be faithful to preach that message to the people that we encounter this week. Help us to preach it to ourselves, to our family members, our friends, our coworkers. God, we want to see people come to know you and experience the joy that can be found only in you. We love you. We praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.